I was a missionary very early one morning, have a very clear impression. I like to think that it was words, but it was something that woke me up. Okay. And the clear words were. This is the first chiasmus that was found in the Book of Mormon. Tell us a little bit about it, Jack. Give us a first-hand account here. Well, sure, Lynn. Uh, I enjoy telling this story, and I'll keep it real brief. But to me, it is still a miracle. It's still amazing that I would have been in a place, in a time, uh, with people, for all these pieces to come together, that I would learn something that I had never dreamed about and never would have. But you were a missionary. You were receiving inspiration from God. I was a missionary, and we were trying to do our best, and we prayed that we would be led and directed, and we hoped that we would meet people whose lives we could bless and who we might be able to teach. And those prayers were answered in many ways, and they are for missionaries everywhere. So this one one instance uh, began when my companion and I were just walking uh, by a bulletin board there in Regensburg, Germany, where we were the only missionaries in that town. And there was a notice that there would be a series of lectures about the New Testament that would be uh, uh, given that summer. And I thought, well, we could probably learn some things there. We walked in and sat down in this lecture. The, actually, we only attended this lecture once because we had conflicts every other Friday when it was uh, being taught. But once was enough. And you think the Lord helped us to get there when this professor was talking about it? Well, I think so. What was he talking about? He uh, said, uh, I just found a book that I'm very excited about. And it's uh, this book by a man named Paul Gector, who was a Jesuit, a Catholic priest. Uh -huh. It turns out that Paul Gector was uh, a very distinguished scholar and was the provost, the academic vice president of the University of Innsbruck okay. in Austria. Didn't know that, but I will meet him on my way home from my mission. But what's the book say that helps him answer that question? Well, the, the book is called The Literary Art in the Gospel of Matthew, and it makes some very strong claims about how Matthew uses chiasmus in a Hebraic way. And that this provides what Gector was calling very strong evidence that Matthew was originally written either in Hebrew or using Hebraic thought. Because of the way he paralleled his, the words. And, and uses these inverted parallelisms. So the, so the professor was asking the question, why do we care which came first? He said, I really don't care which one was written first, but what I care about is what gets me closest to the thinking of Jesus. Jesus was a Jew. He thought like a Jew. And so the use of a Hebraic form in Matthew helps me to read Matthew and know that I'm hearing the authentic cadence and style and organization of thought by Jesus himself. How did that then lead you to find them in the Book of Mormon? Well, the next step was we went to a bookstore and asked there in the Catholic bookstore if they might happen to have a copy of this. As you can tell, this is a monograph. It's in a series, and so it's not a regularly published book. Unusual for a bookstore to have something like this. Okay. Academic, and they had one copy of it. And so I walked home with that, but I also said, if I'm going to study here in this Catholic town, the Gospel of Matthew. And I, after I got into this book, I said, I'm going to go back and I want to buy not a Luther Bible. I want a Catholic Bible so I can talk to Catholic scholars. And so I, as you can see here, I studied the Gospel of Matthew in German, looking up all of the examples that Gechter had given and reading and finding others as well. So you did this prior to finding anything in the Book of Mormon? Yes. Hadn't even thought about it in the Book of Mormon yet. Of course. You're just trying to be more in a community to work with the people there as a good missionary. Let me learn the German thought of the Catholic area that we're in. I was intrigued by it. Yeah, of course you were. And I wanted to know, does it really work? Okay. And it did. And I became 
I wouldn't say an expert overnight with this. Of course, it takes more than just that. But you were interested. You're, you were per, your interest was peaked. I could see on a page how it was laid out, what they were focusing on, and kind of how it worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I had done my homework and went back to work knocking on doors and yeah. talking to people. And, and I talked to some people about this and asked if they'd ever heard of it. And, of course, the answer was no, okay. because this book was published in 1965, only two years before the time I bought the book. Okay, so it's still very new. Yeah, and that's just another little part in the step. If I had been a missionary two years earlier, this book wouldn't have even been in existence. Yeah, the Lord's timing is the miracle. So lots of things did fall into place. Okay, so, okay, so how does this all relate to the Book of Mormon? Well, then, uh, as I was thinking about this and so on, I very early one morning have a very clear impression. I like to think that it was words, but it was something that woke me up. Okay. And it was before the sun had come up. So it's early, four o'clock maybe. And, uh, and the clear words were, well, if it's evidence of Hebrew style in the Bible, it must be evidence of Hebrew style in the Book of Mormon. And, and I didn't go back to sleep. Of course not. And I didn't want to wake up my companion, you know, but I, I got out of bed and I, I did go and get my Book of Mormon. Or I just sat down at the table where we read the, uh, the Book of Mormon before we went to bed. Okay, so you just had your scriptures already out, so you sat down right where you were. Right there and turned on a little lamp. And are you in the German or English? German. Okay. And I uh, just thought, well, I'll start where we left off. Yeah. And that was in Mosiah chapter 4. So as I turned the page on Mosiah chapter 5, it didn't take long for my eye to notice two words, two big, long German words that are the words for transgression. Übertretung. Übertretung. And those two words were right on top of each other. In the German translation, in our English one, they're a little bit offset there. But we're talking about chapter 5, verse 11. Yes, and that this name will never be blotted out, ausgerottet, except it be through übertretung. Transgression. transgression. The English says, therefore take heed that you do not transgress. Yeah. It makes it a verb. Mm -hmm. But the German said, therefore... Guard yourself against transgression. So it's the exact same word. Übertretung. Übertretung. So you are caught this. That the name be not blotted out of your heart. So, you right. so those okay, four words. Two. You said, okay, here's two. Now, are there any others? And you kept looking. So, yes. And then I just started going, well, how above that, below that? And, of course, you can see that you are not found on the left hand of God. Now, the left hand of God only appears here in all of Scripture that I can find, and it appears twice. This has to be intentional. Oh, of course, oh, of course it is. Yeah. You don't do five words in a row and then five words out without it being intentional. Are... It comes to pass. Take upon yourself the name of Christ. You must be called by some other name. Therefore, you find yourself on the left hand of God. I would that you should remember that this is the name that should never be blotted out except it be through transgression. Therefore, and that's the turning point. Yeah. Wow. Okay, don't transgress. Name be not blotted out. I would that you should remember, retain this name, that you're not found on the left hand of God, but to hear and know the voice by which you shall be called, and also the name by which he shall call you. I was pretty excited. I love that. The name, that one, in the wee hours of the morning. And did you feel the spirit? I bet you were ecstatic. Well, it was hard to distinguish the excitement from the spirit, but I think it was both. Yeah. So it was, it was spirit squared. <laughs> and, of course, I, I, you know, I, I was, you know, looking real careful. Wow, what is it? I woke my companion up. and Oh, dear. You know, huh, what's going on here? <laughs> but he had been at the lecture, too. He had, too. And, yeah. of course, he appreciated. And, you know, in the next couple of weeks, I would speak with a lot of people find out more about it. I needed to know more about uh, who else, where else is it in the Bible? Is it just in Matthew? Uh -huh. I, my first question was, is it really in the Old Testament? Yes. And Gector never talks about that. 
Okay. So I had a lot of homework to do. And I went back and talked to the professor and others there in Regensburg to find out what they knew. And uh -huh. and most of them, uh, you know, didn't know very much. Like I said, it's a very obscure kind of subject. And it was today, today it's pretty well known. Yeah. But in, in that yeah, day, it was not. Uh, one of the times when my, I did splits, uh, I went to another town called Lonshut. And as we were uh, going out, the the missionary that I was now working with that day said, you know, we were just retracting the other day and we found a, uh, a Catholic scholar, uh, a, a graduate student, studying at the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome. And he was kind of interested in what we said. Would you like to go talk to him? I said, sure. So... That early, we began explaining this to people, and I learned from them, and they learned from me. And as we talked there with that, that graduate student, he knew faintly a little bit about chiasmus, but, okay. but he was very open. And as I talked to him about this, he was interested. Yes, I can use this. this is... And then I said, uh, you know, we have this Book of Mormon. Have you ever heard of it? And he hadn't. I said, well, let me tell you a little bit about it. And let me show you one of these passages here in this book. And, you know, I became very convinced as I saw this working in changing people's attitudes about the Book of Mormon. They could take it seriously because it could be presented to them on terms that they could relate to. Awesome. So it became a tool that was uh, something that I, I used uh, for the rest of my mission uh, that discovery day was literally the turning point of my mission. Your hump day. Hump day. We served for two years, and it was f the morning of the beginning, first day of my second year. <laughs> so Your it was chiasmus. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's uh, briefly the story of how that was discovered. However, let me give one last uh, little piece here. Because as soon as I knew it was in Mosiah chapter 5, I knew this was the end of King Benjamin's speech. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to go back. I want to go back right now before we eat breakfast. And I want to read all of King Benjamin's speech and at least scan through like I did with the Gospel of Matthew and see what I can find. And I did. I found some in Mosiah chapter 2. Uh, not fully developed, but some of the uh, highlights, I could see that this was a turning point there at the begin at the middle of that text. But most of all, in Mosiah chapter 3, the text about putting off the natural man. The natural man is an enemy to God, and that text is, as we've said, the very center of the, the whole piece. So by the end of that morning, I had found two of the very best examples of chiasmus in the whole Book of Mormon, maybe in the whole world. Uh, the middle of King Benjamin's speech in chapter 3 and the concluding final punctuation of Benjamin's speech in chapter 5. But I also just feel strongly that all of our scripture study can receive personal revelation in our own lives. And it can bless not only our missionary work, but it can bless our own lives and drawing closer to the Lord. You know, this is a miraculous experience that has blessed all of the church members since that time, but who know about it and who could read the scriptures from that perspective. But your scripture study, my scripture study, our scripture study can also have powerful spiritual ramifications if we pray before we study and if we take it to the Lord and we consecrate our time in the scriptures with the Lord. I, I certainly echo that, Lynn. Uh, this, of course, has been a personal project of mine now for a long time. Uh, I, I do not think I was shown this for just my amusement. And I think it's the same with all of our scripture study. If I wanted to learn about this so I could preach the gospel better, so I could be a better missionary. And I think the Lord will help us if we have a reason why we want to know things. And if the reason is to help other people, if it's self-centered, it rarely works. If it's for others, it does. Now let me add one little update, something you won't find in the other Know Why or the YouTube publications of this or anything else, because just a couple months ago, uh, I got a phone call from a, uh, a former law student of mine 
uh, who was married to the daughter of Robert K. Thomas. Uh, Brother Thomas was the academic vice president at BYU, and he was the founder of the honors program, which I was in as a freshman in 1965. And I had him for my Book of Mormon class, uh, my second semester. He also taught a class on the Bible as literature. He was an English professor. And so we did talk a little bit about various uh, literary aspects of the Book of Mormon, as you might imagine. So two days after the morning of the discovery of Chiasmus uh, was the time when we wrote letters home. It's your P-Day again. And I did write a letter to my father and told him about the discovery. And then I sat down and wrote another letter to your old professor, to Robert K. Thomas. And I have had forever the letter that he wrote back to me, where he was excited and said, I've never heard of this. I think this is very convincing. You might talk to so-and-so about it. But in those days, we didn't have a Xerox machine. And I had written a five-page letter on blue paper. And I had never seen it since I put a stamp on the envelope and sent it to him. Except he had kept it in his papers. And as the university was archiving the Robert K. Thomas papers, they had some personal items that... And they found your letter? Did, ...didn't know where they should do. So they had called... Wow. ...my student and his wife and other people in the Thomas family and said, why don't you come and look at these? We've got several items here and we'd like you to uh, advise us on whether these are university items or personal items, and if they're personal, you you should take them. Yeah, they belong to definitely, the family. definitely. Well, I'm holding here uh, these pages of your letter of the letter. That they came I wrote. up. They came across them. Yeah, and there they are. So this is what I wrote two days after the uh, discovery, asking him. I say I think I've found something new and very convincing in the Book of Mormon, but the entire project is, of course, still in infancy. I think there's a little testimony in this to keep records, too. Yes. 